somebody we've been pining to get on because it's one of the most interesting stories in politics. The nominee for the governor of Oregon, of all places, Christine Drazen. Welcome to the program. I I could not be more excited to join you today. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, man, it's 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 our pleasure. I mean, this is so for us. Typically, we think of the state of Oregon and you think, boy, wouldn't it be nice if we could compete there? Like on the federal level, it's been since Gordon Smith, since we've ever sniffed any sort of uh, form of success there. Um, But we've also watched what's happened to Oregon over the years and in particular during COVID and everything else. And we thought, man, if not now, when? And then all of a sudden you show up. And, and look what's happening. You know, Oregonians are feeling the same way you are. Like they're saying, if not now, then when? And they know that our state is an amazing, beautiful state. I mean, no offense to the other states, but we really are pretty fantastic. <laughs> and you just don't get that very much from uh, the single party control and what they've done to our beautiful state. I mean, they have turned Oregon into a petri dish for extreme pro- progressive ideologies that they know from the start that the end result is going to be to harm families, harm businesses, and intentionally pick winners and losers and leave people behind. And they're okay with it. But Oregonians aren't. That's really where we're at right now. That's why we're in the mix. That's why this is a a close race. It's because Oregonians themselves are looking around going, wait a minute, this wasn't the deal. Like, I just want to live my life. And I would like to live it in the place that I love. And that's Oregon. Yeah, well, like you said, I mean, it's an absolutely gorgeous place. I've only visited on a couple of occasions, uh, once in the uh, wine country up there wow. in uh, Willamette. Mm. Which I, I got to tell you, if you're gonna if you're gonna like Pinot Noir, you're gonna love it in Oregon. Boy, oh mm-hmm. boy! Uh, but you know, the one thing that occurred to me as I'm watching from afar what was happening with riots downtown and everything is everybody that I encountered in Oregon was a reasonable individual. And it was very difficult for me to understand how anyone would be okay with yeah. with a basic degradation of society, ripping down buildings, setting stuff on fire, lawlessness that I'd ever met. And, and, and so it was hard for me to comprehend. So that, I mean, in, in, in large part, that's why I'm so encouraged by the fact that you're leading on all these polls. It seems like maybe I was right. Maybe everybody's come to their senses. You know, I... <laughs> I don't even know what to say about that period in our history. It just seems so disconnected from the rest of the state, so disconnected from what makes common sense for what the right response would have been to that moment. I mean, there's one thing, there's protest, and then there's lawlessness. And for some reason, the leaders in Portland in particular just could not see that there is a huge difference between the two and allow one and step in and prevent the other. They just couldn't bring themselves to do that. Uh, But certainly it has been a motivator for Oregonians across the state to say enough is enough. Uh, We are tired of our city uh, being the laughing stock of the nation. We, We see the good in this beautiful place we call home. And we just need common sense back. We need balance in our political life. We need somebody that's gonna say, Uh, you know what, that's just not a good idea. And when it came to a lot of the things that recently passed, we have legalized hard drugs in Oregon. Bad idea from the start. And I have an opponent in this race that's doubling down, saying not only should we protect this legislation that legalized drugs, oh, but oh, by the way, let's do more methadone clinics. I mean, she- I saw this in the debate that you had. I was was literally astonished. I thought I misheard it. What she said basically was that everybody ought to have like methamphetamine access in the middle. I mean, I was just like, what? She is completely out of touch. They, she took away even the smallest protections for schools and kids. She took away the requirement that methadone clinics and needle exchanges couldn't even be placed next to schools. A thousand feet away from a school was too much to ask for. They should be anywhere they want to go. That is how completely out of touch my opponent is in this race. And frankly, I I say this all the time. She just cannot be governor of a state, certainly not my home state of Oregon. Yeah, I mean, it it is so unbelievably irresponsible, but it just defies like, I don't care if you're a progressive or a conservative. Do you think it makes a, a lot of sense to have basically a legalized drug trade next to a school 
in anywhere in this country. Like it's just so unbelievable. It it is a degradation of uh, of our communities, and you know we talk about a lot of stuff that's kind of you know it's political talk, but the reality on the ground here is that we're desperate for change. Yeah, like these are all these are all policies that are actively be, being put in place in my home state, and they have got to be reversed, and they've got to be reversed immediately. Like we are at a do or die moment in Oregon, where it's all in, it's go for broke, it's get this thing done. We have to. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I love about you and your team is that you stay laser focused on the issues that matter, right? You don't mm-hmm. take debate. You don't get sucked into national debates that don't have any concern of Oregonians. You're talking about the issues that have affected them over the last few years, but then more importantly, how you can change it in the future. And I imagine that comes from a wealth of experience. Like you've been a leader in that state for a long time. Now is the opportunity to sort of basically make your case. It seems like you're doing it really well. Well, we're working. I'm out there talking to people, listening and making making my best effort at this thing. Uh, We can't afford another four years of Kate Brown, least popular governor in the nation. And Cantina Kotick in every other sentence says, I don't want to change anything. Let's leave everything just the way it is. She absolutely has embraced this idea that Oregonians are looking for a third term of Kate, and I'm pretty sure they're not. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they're not, too. And it's not all, you know, it's not all Portland, right? I mean, Oregon's nope. got a, a wealth of different perspectives and different industries and different things. that it does. And I, I got to imagine at this point, you're getting the even the center left to take a different look at at how governing ought to operate in a state like Oregon. Yeah, they talk all the time about the need for balance. And we've had 10 years of single party control. So I feel like we've given that experiment an opportunity to run its course. Yeah. And Oregonians are saying we need balance. And, and that represents a change in leadership at the top. That's really the only real way that we are going to get the kind of accountability that we need from, you know, on uh, checks and balances in the legislative branch, in appointments, uh, in the judicial branch, all of it, all of it needs, needs a course correction. No question about it. So I know you're a lifelong Oregonian. Uh, the state obviously means a lot to you. How did you get into politics, right? I mean, it's it's a, it's a tough line of work for anybody. It's a really tough line of work for a Republican in Oregon. <laughs> I'm originally from a small town in Oregon, kind of in the southeastern portion of my state. And I had family that talked politics when I was growing up. For better or worse, you know, they... My mom uh, was the only girl in her family with four brothers and everybody in my family had strong opinions. And but what they all agreed on was that for the most part, politicians were not paying any attention to people in our state, especially people in the small towns. And and here in Oregon, you know, we're dependent on on federal policy around water quite a bit, wildfire management, like these very big issues that were affecting our day to day. And I was raised in a family that was impacted by that. And they weren't shy about making that connection for me. So I always viewed um, our civic life as being something that we should all pay attention to. Yeah. And it and it really did kind of lead me to choosing to be staff inside the legislature. Uh, in my misspent youth, I was in my mere 20s <laughs> at the time. Yeah. And, you know, I've got a similar you story. Talk. <laughs> right. Yeah. But it gives you a lot. You learn a lot. It's an opportunity to really kind of see behind the curtain and better understand how people wield power and how people compromise. And um, and I just, you know, I love my state. It it felt like a critical moment to step up and step in and fight for the future. And I'm grateful to be in this position, in this race right now. I know we got a long ways to go. We got a long fight in front of us still. But I, I am grateful to be at this point in the race. Well, we're sure happy you did. The latest polls from Nelson Research, Clout Research, DHM Research, they all show you leading. And and that's, look, with a month to go, that's kind of where you want to be. Uh, before we go any further, I got three big questions for you. And, <laughs> and, and like these are the things that people pay attention to on the Ruthless Variety program. Uh, if your last, If you could plan your last meal on earth, what would it be? You know, uh, I am a frequent listener, first time caller. And so oh, nice. I knew the question was coming. <laughs> Good. And I, 
And this is really what I gave some thought to. And I'm landing on a tapas. That way I can get a little bit of a variety of things. So I'm going to go some seared ahi. I'm going to go some papa, some uh, papas bravas, uh, maybe a little vegetables provincial with a sidecar. We need the sidecar in there. <laughs> I love it. I mean, it's relatively healthy, right? For your last meal. I mean, I feel like. Uh, Why not? Yeah. And you got to go. I mean, you got to top it off with a little of that Pinot Noir. I mean, that that is just. Well, fair, fair point, fair point. (laughs) I love it. All right. So if you never got into this line of work, the intersection of of public policy and and public service and everything that you've been doing with your professional career and you had a blue sky to plan anything that you wanted, what would it be? I have a real disconnect with the value of capitalism. And so I've always been interested in stuff that doesn't really earn you money. So <laughs> <laughs> so I think that I would be a professional archery instructor. Is that right? Are you, yep. do, you do you shoot arrows yourself? Yes. You do. I mean, this is that's a first <laughs> on the variety program. We've had no really. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Everybody, no other else archers. Has, everybody else has the sense to choose something where they can make some money. Uh, you know, not <laughs> always, not always, but, but I would say archery is, <laughs> it's a fairly niche interest group. Well, there you go. There you go. <laughs> I love try to that. Keep, try to keep it lively. Oh, I love that. That's great. All right. So the last question, which uh, as a listener, you know, it's coming. It, our view is that everybody th- that's successful is sort of motivated at some level by one of two things, the thrill of victory or the agony of defeat. And the thrill of victory, it, it doesn't mean you know that you're, you're more committed to winning than the person who's in agony of defeat. Basically, it's sunny optimist charging up the hill. You've got the next challenge. The agony of defeat person, every success they've ever had in life, they take like five minutes to appreciate. But every setback, they carry it around like a backpack, right? So- <laughs> On that spectrum, where do you find yourself? 100% agony of defeat. I mean, I'm a Republican Republican in Oregon. Does this surprise you? No, not at all. I mean, that was the most predictable answer you could have got. I'm so so glad that you were authentic about it. (laughs) You know what? But this year, on the other side of this race, I'm going to go all in. I'm going to go all in for the victory. You are going to change my perspective. You and everybody else in the conservative universe ought to be all into this one because it's one of the best stories in politics. I can't think of anything that would send a better message to the way that cities and states that are monolithically run in a progressive fashion. I can't imagine a better message to all of those places than you coming out victorious in this election. If our people want to help you, where do they go? Christine for Oregon dot com. Christine for Oregon dot com. I imagine you're going to if you if you're walking roads, if you're knocking on doors, if you're putting up signs or if you can contribute something, even with Biden's inflation, uh, you're all takers here. We'll take it all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's awesome. All right. The next governor of the great state of Oregon, Christine Drazen. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Take care.